working in progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we prepare to open the word of the Lord and that of his prophet, shall we seek his guidance? Shall we ask him to enlighten our minds, to guide us with a blessing from on high so that we may properly understand that where we are at this time and seek so that we may be prepared for the work that is yet before us. Shall we pray? Loving Father, you would desire that all should be saved. Yet the scripture of truth show us that very few choose this path. We have sinned, Father. We have sought our own way. We have chosen the way of iniquity, the way of idolatry. We have chosen a way that is not yours. Cleanse us, Father, as David asked. Help us now, Father, to take these words, to accept that which you would show us, prepare us for that which you would have us to understand, so that we may more properly give your message at this time to this world. In this, please guide us, direct us, be with us. May your angels attend us. May our minds be open to receiving that which you would have us to understand. For this, we thank you, and this we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, we're going to take just a little step back. There are some things that I was led to look at in preparation for this meeting that I believe we need to consider. These are items that are open for discussion. These are items that we are going to need for today and for these last moments of this earth's history. Now I'm gonna be asking that, that others help read in some of this. We're going to go in through three verses and then a fourth in Zephaniah. We have another document as well that we're going to attempt to cover. Now, the first three verses of Zephaniah 2, according to the translators, are an exhortation to repentance. Consider carefully what this means to you. Consider what this means for the near future. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation, not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Passes the chaff, fierce anger come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. In different manners, Zephaniah is giving us a warning. And in, in a way of looking at this, this could be a threefold testing message. Zephaniah 
Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Now, in comparing these three verses with points from what Mrs. White had been shown, in testimony number four, we are given the following. Is, is this 1850? Yes. Okay. When you go in and you take a look at the writings of Mrs. White, and you take a look to see the words of Zephaniah that she used, There's 220 references according to the Ellen White website. Now, many of those may be in current publications. Now, as you're aware, I prefer to go back to the original documents wherever possible. <clears throat> now, I must correct myself. This was actually written in 1857. Okay, thanks. Okay. I just knew it was early. I was wondering how early. Right. November 20th, I was shown the people of God and saw them mightily shaken. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, which expressed their internal struggle. There was a firmness and great earnestness expressed in their countenances, while large drops of perspiration rose upon their foreheads and fell. Now and then their faces would light up with the marks of God's approbation, and again the same solemn, earnest, anxious look settled upon them. <clears throat> now, as I looked at these, it was interesting because there were some marks that the Ellen White website placed in red that were not easy to see in the, body, in the body of these documents. One such was marked with a star. I footnoted it as number one. Now I'm gonna scroll down to the footnote. I would like someone to read what was being applied as the footnote to this paragraph. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine inheritance to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore, should they say among the people, where is their God? Joel 2, verse 15 to 17. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. James 4, 7 through 10. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff. Wherefore, the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. 
it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Zephaniah 2, 1 to 3. What was interesting about this, as I was preparing for this meeting, I was led to look at this document. I had to look at it several times to understand how Zephaniah was being tied in. These notes do not and are not easy to see because they're part of these notes that the Ellen White website, rather than footnoting the document, has chosen to put just a little notation and you have to go find the reference and it comes up in a small window. Here, we are getting a combination of Zephaniah with James and with Joel. Joel, the book, led to the first great split in this movement. There are many to this day that do not accept Joel as a warning against the establishment of the vision. Yet Mrs. White is seeing that there are earnest seeking ones with strong faith. Can someone read this next paragraph that begins, Evil Angels? Evil angels crowded around them, pressing their darkness upon them to shut out Jesus from their view, that their eyes might be drawn to the darkness that surround them, surrounded them, and they distrust God, and next murmur against him. Their only safety was in keeping their eyes directed upward. Angels were having the charge over the people of God. And as the poisonous atmosphere from these evil angels was pressed around these anxious ones, the angels which had the charge over them were continually wafting their wings over them to scatter the thick darkness that surrounded them. What does this say to you? Here we have a situation. If we are ever looking upward, if we are keeping our eyes upon God, are we not going to praise him in all things? Will we not have faith that he is yet in charge and that we near need to fear nothing? as long as he remains in charge. For can anything or anyone unseat God from the throne of the universe? I'd have to say no. I would agree. Let's look at this sad paragraph that follows. Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed indifferent and careless. What will be, will be. They were not resisting the darkness around them, and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left them and went to the aid of those earnest praying ones. I saw the angels of God hasten to the assistance of everyone who were struggling with all their energies to resist these evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance but the angels left those who made no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them.
This is a sad but very powerful paragraph. As these praying ones continued their earnest cries, at times a ray of light from Jesus came to them and encouraged their hearts and lighted up their countenances. Where did this ray of light come from? What does she say? Well, it came from Jesus. This ray of light came from Palmoni. This ray of light came from the wonderful numberer. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen. <clears throat> I was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to Smyrna. Right? Oops, <laughs> missed that one. I was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. It will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver of the testimony. And it will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. This straight testimony, some will not bear. They will rise up against it, and this will cause a shaking amongst God's people. July 18th. Yeah. Um, right. so, so I wonder what, you know, regular Adventists you know, the ones who are preaching this smooth message that the whole church is going to go through and that the church is, is doing everything that God is asking it to do. How are they, how would they apply this straight testimony? I mean, what, what, what would they expect it to be? Where would they expect it to come from? And you understand my question? I do. Somewhat. Well, it's just that people aren't looking for this. I mean, they, they don't have any conception of what this might be. I mean, Adventists know about this. I'm talking about conservative Adventists even. And, yeah, and, you're right. And, you know, right now, if you look at conservative Adventism, it's, it's really departed from what it was 30 years ago. Now, the conservative speakers, people like... Uh, you know, Ty Gibson, well, you know, they would consider him conservative, and David Asherick, Asherick, however you say his name. Asherick. Asherick, yeah. And, and these others, um, they, they, they're not really looking for this message. They think that they have it, that they're the ones giving it. But it's nothing close to anything we would call the straight testimony. True. Um, observation here: the when I ask what the three angels' message is, they just parrot the, um, you know, the three angels' message. They don't know that the three angels' messages is a group of messages. They have no clue to that at all. I didn't when I first started this. Uh, but studied into it, and, and now I, I do have a clue. But well, people aren't ready to do that. They want it to be spoon-fed to them well, the by one their thing, pastors. Yeah. So one of the things about the three angels' messages that I didn't understand before I was in this movement was, I mean, I knew what they were as far as the, the Bible verse, as you say, but I didn't know where they were placed. I couldn't tell you when the first angel's message was given and how that was done or the second angel's message. Millerite history was a complete mystery to me. 
And I think that's true for most Seventh-day Adventists. Yes, that's correct. I only heard a little tiny bit about Miller, and it was mostly about Ellen White, but no, I never heard any kind of um, compatibility to the two of those. You know, yeah, I never, Miller, never heard any of that. And Miller would be presented in a negative light. At, um, yes, somewhat. He had many mistakes and so forth. Right. False, false doctrine. But if you start looking at Adventist history, a, a lot of those ones that had some sort of light um, that may have stayed with the, the subject or stayed with the church or they had some little bit of light and then they fell off like um, Smith, like Snow, uh, the list goes on and on. But they did have some, some truths to them. You just had to define them and, and, and um, dig them out. But in this, in this situation, <clears throat> how often is the straight testimony of the true witness to the Laodiceans being paired with the messages of Revelation 14 and the other angel? Consider Could you ask that, that again? Could I you, said, how often, that? how often is the testimony of the true witness to the Laodiceans being combined with the messages of Revelation 14 and that of the other angel, Revelation 18? Uh, in my time at the church, I don't think I ever heard it talked about. So my point that I'm led to consider is that the messages of Revelation 14 and Revelation 18, along with Revelation 3, the message of the true witness to the Laodiceans, combined together is a message to the movement. Once the message is accepted by the movement and truly placed where it should be, then the message will go out to the world. They're not separate messages. How can you give a testimony? How can you give a message? If it has not affected you, me, us first. Consider this carefully as we go through the rest of this document. I saw that the testimony of the true witness had not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance and all that truly receive it will obey it and be purified. How can the church, how can the movement set aside this paragraph? If we choose to set this aside right now, what are we? Are we not then lukewarm? And what happens to those that are lukewarm?
the comment in the chat, those that are lukewarm will be spit out. That is a fearful decision. If we're not willing to heed <clears throat> the true witness, if we are not willing to heed the message to Laodicea, and by heeding the message to Laodicea, accept the message of Revelation 14, if we are then spit out, if we are spewed out of his mouth, We become nothing. Said the angel, list ye, listen here. Soon I heard a voice that sounded like many musical instruments, all sounding in perfect strains, sweet and harmonious. It surpassed any music I had ever heard. It seemed so full of mercy of compassion and elevating, holy joy. It thrilled through my whole being. Said the angel, look ye, listen and look. My attention was then turned to the company I had seen before who were mightily shaken. I was shown those whom I had before seen weeping and praying with agony of spirit. I was shown those whom I had before seen sighing and crying. I saw that the company of guardian angels around them had doubled. And they were clothed with an armor from their head to their feet. They moved in exact order, firm like a company of soldiers. Their countenances expressed the severe conflict which they had endured, the agonizing struggle that they had passed through. Yet their features, marked with the severe internal anguish, shone now with the light and glory of heaven. They had obtained the victory and it called forth from them the deepest gratitude and holy sacred joy. Is there a struggle when many around you agree with political or emotional references Are we not struggling when we delve into the word to make sense of things that perplex us? When we are looking upon patterns that we find within the word, when we are looking to understand what God is trying to sell us at this time, listen and look. We are told to listen. We are told to look. Where are we told to speak? Are we not being shown that we are to receive the information before we give the information? If we listen and we look, what does she say will happen? That these that are sighing and crying, that are weeping, that are praying with agony of spirit, will have their guardian angels doubled and they will be clothed with armor from their head to their feet. What kind of a promise is that for you today?
an uplifting one for sure. The numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. The careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to agonize, to persevere and plead for it, did not obtain it. And they were left behind in darkness. And their numbers were immediately made up by others taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks. Still the evil angels pressed around them but they could have no power over them. So um, it says the careless and indifferent, and um, I, I can really see that now, um, especially since what's been going on here lately. Uh, if, if you don't hold all the, all the principles, then you become careless. And when I'm talking about the principles, I'm talking about, you know, what we've learned, the symbology, the, 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 the connections that we've gained. Um, that's the carelessness if it's not adhered to in that, in Miller's manner. Right. The indifferent, I'm not sure who that, that exactly represents. Um, not caring, just I'm here for the, just to see what's up kind. I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. What about, what about those that are unwilling to study on their own? Yes. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, we are, I, I, study to me is, is different than, you know, a lot of people. I mean, I, I study all the time. That's sure. Um, that's not an issue for me. It's it, the, the, but I get it. You know, there are other folks that, that they just want to be spoon fed this stuff, uh, you know, instead of working for it. I mean, because you really do you need, you kind of need to really work for this stuff to, to understand it, to put it into its perspective. So, you know, it can fire upon those neurons that we have where we got all this information logged to the right, correct order in the correct manner of how it comes out. Like somewhat, I'm not trying to build Theodore up, but he does have a perspective of, of, of the chronology and it's, it's much plainer to him than to the rest of us. Um, but if we don't handle it, we're never going to get it like him. So we got to handle it. We got to study it. We got to, we got to actually try to make those connections and the crawling off the chronology that, that, uh, uh Stephen has, um, issued out here is very, very helpful. Um, the different things that we've we've come across and have that have been given out are become very very helpful to to um, to make those neurons fire in the right order. So we can put these these this chronology all together because it makes great sense uh, once you're able to establish the chronology. Yeah, and of course, you know, we're not all the same. We don't all have the same minds. So no, no, no. God, God doesn't expect everyone to have exactly the same understanding of things. Well, but that's why there has to be so many of us. Yeah, but within the capacity that each of us have, um, we, we must exercise that talent and, and understand things to the best of our ability. And, and we can't just approach something and say it's too difficult. And plus, we have things like Steve, as you mentioned, Stephen's... Uh, chronology charts, uh, they're very, very helpful for those that are visual. We may not be mm -hmm. able to remember all the dates, but we should be able to, to take this material. And we should know how to share it with others. Even mm -hmm. if, we, you know, we shouldn't all be able, you know, not everyone can go up to a whiteboard and just rattle off, you know, 50 different dates. And <laughs> not alone. Because one is it takes practice, but also it just takes a natural aptitude. But that doesn't make someone uh, better than someone else just because they understand something. You know, that's part of the, the thing about this message. It's not so much what somebody understands. It's their approach to understanding. How are, how are they struggling and agonizing? And how is this 
this information changing that person? Mm. Is it is it is it changing his character? Is it refining his character? If it isn't, it's merely head knowledge. And it, and it ha serves no benefit other than to puff up. I agree. I agree. It's it, that kind of stuff that I'm trying to uh, work out is, you know, as it comes in, um, the character change has to be developed. It's and it's a, a process. <laughs> I mean, because you know, you once you start doing things in the same order all the time, then it's, it's, it's easy to do, but you know, in the beginning it's the step-by-step step and you, you know, you, the, you end up self-flagellating or whatever it is, you know, to, to make yourself remember things. Well, well, it's a process, but it's also a miracle as well. Yes. Because it's God's creative word that transforms the human heart. Yes. a point <clears throat> from from what we were addressing at the very outset this document being written in 1857 could this be a response or a companion document to much of that that Hiram Edson had written that was published in 1856 Edson was being very careful and very, very direct about the seven times. The applications that Mrs. White is making here, I think are applications that many, even today, would find difficult to accept. Just as many today within the corporate church are choosing to set aside Leviticus 26. Now the first of the footnotes, the numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. Come down here and the footnote reads, I know thy works that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would that, would, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knoweth that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Who is speaking here? In Revelation 3, 15 to 17. Who do we accept with speaking here? It's Christ. Now. As we go here. Still the evil angels pressed around them, but they could have no power over them. This was marked by a cross. And footnoted number three. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, or wicked spirits in heavenly places, as it reads in the margin. Can someone else read the rest of this footnote, please? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, 
wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all spirits, Ephesians 6, 12 through 18. What does that say to you? When we compare this here, that the evil, still evil angels pressed around them and they could have no power over them. Is this not a great promise? Does this not show us, does this not show us that our faith accepting God's word as it is given is our most important point? Yes. Okay. Okay. I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth in great power. It had effect. I saw those who had been bound. Some wives had been bound by their husbands and some children had been bound by their parents. The honest who had been held or prevented from hearing the truth now eagerly laid hold of the truth spoken. All fear of their relatives was gone. The truth alone was exalted to them. It was dearer and more precious than life. They had been hungering and thirsting for truth. I ask what had made this great change. An angel answered. It is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. Since December 6th, have we not been receiving much of the latter rain? Have we not been seeing much truth be revealed? Yes, we have. Much. Have we also not seen many that have stood with us before that are choosing to reject the truth? When you hunger and you're thirsting for something, That's powerful. You really want something to drink. You really want something to eat. How often have we been seeing this hungering and thirsting for this word of the Lord within this movement? How badly do we want the latter rain? How badly do we wish to see the loud cry of the third angel? There are many today that will tell you that the three angels' messages are being given with much power within the church. They believe that they've already understood everything that there is to understand. 
of the message of fear God, to give glory to him, that the hour of his judgment has come. The hour of his judgment, the warning of accepting the mark of the beast and the promise of accepting the seal of God is the third angel's message. The third angel's message in verity are those that will become righteous by their faith in God. Because they see no righteousness within themselves. Because they understand only through God can they become righteous. Have we reached this point where the third angel's message, the loud cry of that third angel, is going out? What do you think? And to me, it's a simple question. My premise right now is that the loud cry has yet to go out. Yeah, it's not. It's not. I haven't heard it. Therefore, while the latter rain has begun to fall all the way around us, it has not yet been recognized. We have not seen or accepted the refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Great power was with these chosen ones. Said the angel, look ye. My attention was turned to the wicked or unbelievers. They were all astir. The zeal and the power of the people of God had aroused and enraged them. Confusion, confusion was on every side. I saw measures taken against this company who were having the power and the light of God. Darkness thickened around them, yet they stood, approved of God, and trusting in him. I saw them perplexed. Next, I heard them crying unto God earnestly. Though the day, through the day and the night, their cry ceased not. I heard these words, thy will, O God, be done. If it can glorify thy name and make a way of escape for thy people. Deliver us from the heathen around us. They have appointed us unto death, but thine arm can bring salvation. These are all the words I can bring to mind. They seem to have a deep sense of their unworthiness and manifested entire submission to the will of God. Yet everyone, without an exception, was earnestly pleading and wrestling like Jacob for deliverance. I missed. So, wait, this is chronologically, it appears that this is not right yet. Or is it? I think it's beginning. What if this confusion that's all around us is part of the wicked and their determination for this great reset? Mm. For what do they really want? 
They want control. If they have the control, if they've taken everything away from everyone else, just like kings and czars, those that are left are the serfs. They are the slaves. They are the people that are not of the great intelligence. They are the people that are there to do the bidding of the ruling class. Yeah, it's a bit reminiscent of captains and kings, isn't it? Very much. Now, bear with me for just a second, because I had missed one of the footnotes. I will read to you what it says. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long, with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, he shall find, shall he find faith on the earth. Luke 18, 7 and 8. 1, 8, 7. Have we not seen this before? See also Revelation 14, 14, and 15. 13, 13, is that what you said? I said 14, 14. 14, 14. And, and verse 15. <laughs> so the question is being asked, shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Where else do we find those that are sighing and crying, crying day and night? Do we not find this in the visions of Ezekiel? Soon after they commenced their cry, the angels in sympathy would have gone to their deliverance. But a tall, commanding angel suffered them not. Said he, the will of God is not yet fulfilled. They must drink of the cup. They must be baptized with the baptism. What cup is being referred to here? What baptism is being required? What people are being described here? I would submit to you, this is another example of the 144,000. On that point, I stand ready to be corrected. But I bring this to you for your consideration. What tall commanding angel has the power to say the will of God is not yet fulfilled. They must drink of the cup. They must be baptized with the baptism. Would that be Michael? Would, would that be Jesus? I would say it must be.
Christ alone understood what it meant to be separated from his father. Did he not ask that this cup pass from him? Mm -hmm. They must drink of the cup. Would any angel understand what the cup was? Would any angel have had the experience of drinking from? the cup well only the one they must be baptized with the baptism can somebody read this paragraph please which one soon i heard Soon I heard the voice of God, which shook the heavens and the earth. There was a mighty earthquake. Buildings were shaken down and fell on every side. I then heard a trumpet shout of victory, loud, musical, and clear. I looked upon this company who, a short time before them, how beautiful, I'm sorry, a short time before them, were in such distress and bondage. Their captivity was turned. A glorious light shone upon them. How beautiful they then looked. All weariness and marks of care were gone. Health and beauty were seen in every countenance. Their enemies, the heathen round them, fell like dead men. They could not endure the light that shone upon the delivered holy ones. This light and glory remained upon them until Jesus was seen in the clouds of heaven and the faithful Pride, glory remained upon them until Jesus was seen in the clouds of heaven and the faithful tried company was changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye from the glory to glory and the death and the grave and together with all the living saints were caught up to meet their Lord in the air while the rich musical shouts of glory and victory were upon every immortal tongue and proceeding from every sanctified holy lip. Amen. Here we are shown that when they drink of the cup and they are baptized with this baptism, that the voice of God is heard. And it shakes heaven and the earth. The footnote that's applied here the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Joel 3.16, also Hebrews 12.26, Revelation 16.17. When God speaks, earth and heaven tremble. That's being another comment from the chat says Matthew 20, 22, and 23. Why is that important? What are you seeing here?
what is being seen by Matthew 20, 22 and 23. Okay, so that's the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this document written in 1857, would look to have been given as an encouragement to those at that time but they needed to understand what was soon to occur. As this has been presented, this was a testimony to the church. It was the fourth testimony to the church. Are not the messages of Revelation 14 and the other angel of Revelation 18 also for testimonies to the church and to the movement. Consider that for your study in this week. Manuscript 3, 1861. There are those at Mill Grove and vicinity who are, in, who are sincere in their faith and who earnestly desire to advance with the people of God. Some have opposing companions and friends, which has made the battle very hard for them. And then to have the additional discouragement of having in the church professed Sabbath keepers who are rebellious and undisciplined, who are slack and loose in all their business transactions and yet are zealous to attend meetings and take an active part is heart rending. They come full of darkness and their course, their daily walk and general deportment is a continual reproach to the cause of God and they keep those out who love order, cleanliness, discipline, and refinement. Sister Eggleston has been in danger of going to the opposite extreme in some things. Her husband is not in the faith. The influence of those who professed to be Sabbath keepers yet bore no fruit to the glory of God has been such as to disgust him and cause him to shut his eyes to the light. He thinks that a great portion of Sabbath keepers are like a certain class in Mill Grove, and he and other unbelievers think it is their faith, their peculiar views, which makes them what they are, slack, untidy, and undisciplined. And although their judgment is convinced that we have the truth, the inconsistent lives of professed Sabbath keepers shut them away from the society and influence of those Sabbath keepers whose life and influence would be a recommendation to their faith. Sister Eggleston's husband would now be established in the truth if there had been a right influence among Sabbath keepers in and about Mill Grove. God requires his people to arise and shake off hindering clogs. And then when laborers come among them, they will be benefited and will not stop to notice this article of dress and that apron or bonnet, but all will take hold earnestly to arise. Each will attend to his and her own case. 
Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. The meek of the earth who keep God's commandments are here addressed. All should lay hold of the truth and let it elevate them. They should take hold of the work in earnest. Some are very fearful of being like the world. And those who would express the most fear in this matter are those whose lives are not circumspect and a recommendation to their faith. Their fear should be exercised in a different direction, and they fear lest they give unbelievers occasion to speak reproachfully of our faith. We are now a sect everywhere spoken against, and we are by some accounted the offspring off scourging of all things. Many unbelievers say it is only the weak-minded and the poor, low class of society, who believe these singular doctrines. And the inconsistent course of some professed Sabbath keepers give them occasion to say such things. We are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. 1 Corinthians 4.9. It is of the highest importance that Sabbath keepers live out their faith in every particular. They should be prompt and neat and keep their business matters all straight. If they believe the truth from the heart, they will do this. The truth will, if carried out, reform their lives. None should be so fearful of being like the world that it will lead them to be careless in their houses, leaving things in disorder and uncleanliness. It is no pride to be neat in dress, cleanly in person, orderly and tasteful in their household arrangements, <clears throat> in their yards and around their houses. These outside appearances tell the business character of those living in the house. And not only this, but the religious character of its inmates. It is impossible for a slack, disorderly person to make a good Christian. <clears throat> Their lives in temporal and religious things are just as disorderly as their dress, houses, persons, and premises. What are we to take from these words of Mrs. White? What do you see here in connection with what we're studying in Zephaniah? Are we not told by speech and action that we are to do all to the glory of God? Yes. Would that also not mean that if we're doing all to his glory, that we are treating each transaction, each conversation, each interaction with others as if we are doing this with God himself. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> then.
there are points on which I look within my own life where I know that change needs to occur. I start within my own life because I cannot and I will not point at others when I know that there's so much more to be changed within my own life. This situation in the study of Zephaniah with its combination with the messages of Revelation 3, Revelation 14, and Revelation 18 is opening this word and these warnings in an entirely different manner than has been done in the past. Because how often have we applied the message to the church of Laodicea with the three angels' message? How often have we accepted it in that manner? I think we said this before. We have not seen this within the church. And I would dare say we have not seen this within the movement. My problem is, is I'm trying to figure out what the message is to give. So, <laughs> you know, we, we, we haven't got a complete message at this point. Well, the message, the message is not really the, the main thing. The message will be given to those who sigh and cry mm -hmm. and get their lives in order. I mean, the message is developing and growing, but it's not so much the message as the people who give it that really matters. The, the, the living message. Yeah. This last week, as we were studying, there was a premise that I ask about, and I ask us to consider. See if I can bring this up here very quickly. As we were going through this, we were taking a look at the Jubilee cycle that occurred from 457 BC when the third decree went out to rebuild Jerusalem. We had 49 years that then led us to 408 BC. When we look at from 408 BC to 27 AD, when Christ was baptized, we have a period of 434 years. Our midpoint in this came to 191 BC. And in 191 BC, we have the Battle of Thermopylae, which was Rome against Greece. We looked as we considered because the premise we had addressed before 
was that Rome establishes the vision. The city of Rome was established in 753 BC, 30 years after it was established, Israel was taken captive by Assyria in 723, 19 years after the prophecy of Isaiah 7 was given. 30 years became something that we looked at as a possible waymark. I found it very interesting that in 191 BC, Rome battled Greece at Thermopylae. Now there had been a point in 480 BC where the Medes and the Persians battled Greece also at Thermopylae. Here is the situation. From the Battle of Thermopylae in 191, where Rome defeats Greece, at the end of that 30 year period, the Jews choose to seek a league with Rome. Were they to seek such a league with any of the nations round about them? No. Did God not warn them in his covenant with them that they were not to seek this type of a league? They had many, many, many warnings. Yet they chose to seek a league with Rome, just as they did with the Gibeonites. Herein, Rome is not only establishing a vision, but also establishing a pattern. Because when we look at this, after this 30 year period, where Rome has now defeated Greece, three years after the Jews begin to seek this league, we are given the, the factor of 158 that we see upon the charts. Because in 158, the league and the information thereof is brought back again to the Jews. So you have a period of 30 and a period of three. Christ is born in 4 BC. 30 years later, he is baptized. Three and a half years after he is baptized, he is crucified. Another pattern of 30 and three. In the year 508, we see that paganism is beginning to be hidden from the scene. And in 538, we see the rise of the papal power. I was intrigued to note that in 508 AD, not only was this the conclusion of Miller's 666, but from the founding of Rome, it was also 1,260 years. which means by 538, when the papacy is now 
on the throne, we are at 1,290 years from the founding of Rome. Now, I, I interrupted somebody's comment. I apologize. No, I just said that was interesting. That's all. Completion of Miller's 666. Yep. So here we have 1290, 1260, and 666 all being tied together. But we are also seeing a pattern of 30 and 3. We are now in a situation, as had been pointed out before, that Elder Jeff began to study into these things in 1989. And he recognized by 2019 that this was the 30th year wherein he had begun to study. As was pointed out, we have a symbol that also involves 2023. Okay, um, just another interesting point, um, yeah. whether this is significant or not. So, so one of the things is we see this, what's it's called, Ab Urbe Condita. Yes. So that's the year of the founding of Rome. Yes. And one of the dates that we mark um, significantly is the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Right. Now, I mean, this is just the fact that the Battle of Actium uh, occurs. Um, uh, it's going to occur in the year of the founding of Rome in 723. So like seven, and that's pretty obvious if 753 BC is the date of the founding of Rome, which is 30 years prior to the, the 1260 for paganism beginning, right? Right. Then it would follow that the Battle of Actium is going to be 723 or the 723rd year in the founding of Rome. Right. So that date 723 or that symbol of 723, uh, which in reverse is the symbol of March 27th. Right. Um, happens to lie up, lie, lie with the year 31 AD, the Battle of Actium. And that then becomes significant. So that is we're taking the year 723 BC and it becomes a symbol that in the 723rd year of the founding of Rome, that lies with the Battle of Actium. And the Battle of Actium begins a period of 360 years or a time that's going to end in 330 AD. So, so it's kind of an interesting uh, puzzle. I don't know if you can picture it, but. No, I get it. I get what you're saying. Yeah. So I, I just thought that was interesting. The point that's, that I'm, I'm looking to present here. But it's part of Rome establishing the vision is, is kind of my point. Well, uh, de definitely my point as well. Yeah. yeah. We've, we've had the question asked, how do we prove this? This is the light that God has seen necessary to provide at this time using history with scripture. And is this not the way that Father Miller presented his determinations from 1833 to 1844? We're coming to the close of our, our time today. 
there is still a document to be read, which we will get into this next week. There's still a lot more for us to consider from the book of Zephaniah. Any other comments or questions? Well, if Stephen, when Stephen watches this video, because he's not here right now, uh, it'd be nice if he could draw out that Battle of Actium and the 360 and uh, uh, 723 in the, the year of the founding of Rome. So, Well, the other part that I, I found interesting was this dealing with Thermopylae. Since we had Media Persia against Greece, and then we had Greece against Rome. Yeah, and it's the center year of the 62 weeks. Yes. Right. And and of course, those that center of the 62 weeks, a, a period of 434 years, divided in half is 21, 7, so 217 years. Right. Which is, which is a symbol of midnight, which is also a symbol uh, that's derived from uh, the week of Christ. So it, it ties to the week of Christ. That is, you can divide the the 62 weeks by 31, right, into two periods of 217 years, right? 31 weeks is 217 years. And the week of Christ has Christ crucified in the midst in 31 AD. So you divide the seven by 31. So seven times 31 is 217. It's just a very profound symbol. But that we have this significant date in the middle, um, something which I'd been looking for in the past, but I never thought of this event, um, I think is quite significant anyway. So in, in this situation, <clears throat> it, with what we're looking at, not only does this tie us into the week of Christ, it also ties us very directly with that which Father Miller had presented. So we are tied with Samuel Snow's letters. We are tied with the Millerite time frame. We are tied with the week of Christ, all inextricably. Right. And what we're doing is we're taking, because we already have the two uh, 1260s that are a counterfeit of Christ's covenant week. But we're now taking those dates that are connected with that center part, the 30 years, uh -huh. and we're tying them back with pagan Rome, with events in his, its history. Right. So, so we can see that pagan and papal Rome both carry the characteristics of the 30 years. Right. And they both exactly. carry these, these structures. So it's just right. we're just seeing this structure more completely. Exactly. Okay, any other comments? Any other thoughts? Okay, shall we then pray? Gracious Father, we thank you for these many items that you are bringing to light, that you are showing us for this time. Thank you, Father, for the affirmation of the direction that has been given. Thank you for giving us the time to learn and to look upon these items so that we may truly understand your leading and your care for us. I thank you for each one that has attended this meeting. I thank you for those that will attend by watching it later. Direct us now, Father. Help us through this Sabbath that we may keep our eyes upon you. Direct us in the path that you would have us to walk. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.